Hello, everybody. How does this sound? Is this good? Is it okay in the back? Okay back there? Yes. All right. Excellent. Um, wonderful. Thank you all for being here. And um, I'm glad that we have power, which we didn't initially. <laughs> so that's exciting. You can hear me. There are lights on. Um, we're all here for Poetry in the Park, the uh, second reading in the series this season. I'm really thrilled to be here and for all of you to be joining us. So thank you so much. Um, thrilled, of course, also to welcome uh, Zach Pieper, Lane Hall, Portia Cobb, and Daryl Harris, who is, uh, will be here momentarily. Um, my name is Mike Went. I'm the program director at Woodland Pattern. Um, and we have the, the great privilege of being able to host this series every summer. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that in Milwaukee, we live and work on traditional Potawatomi, Ho-Chunk, and Menominee homelands along the southwest shores of Michigami, part of North America's largest system of freshwater lakes where the Milwaukee, Menominee, and Kinnikinick rivers meet, and the people of Wisconsin sovereign Anishinaabe, Ho-Chunk, Menominee, Oneida, and Mohican nations remain present. We further acknowledge the grave evil colonialism introduced to these lands through genocide as well as slavery, but also via, via excuse me, via xenophobic, uh, racist and xenophobic beliefs, laws, and practices that continue to inflict harm upon black, brown, and indigenous lives. We honor those who have lived and do live now at these intersections of identity and experience and are committed to the active dismantling of white supremacy. Again, um, thank you for joining us here at Juno Park. Uh, many thanks, uh, of course, to the poets. Also, many thanks, I have to say, to um, those who've uh, been supporting this series, uh, Juno Park Friends. Thank you very much. Uh, the National Endowment for the Arts. Thank you, NEA, in the ether all around us. Um, and Village Church, thank you. And to Bob Hansen, who facilitated that. Um, um, uh, wonderful support, so that's uh, really grateful for that. Um, I'd invite you to uh, visit our book table right there. We have books for sale by um, poets who are reading um, this evening as well as a couple for in future um, readings. Speaking of future readings, if you come back here uh, on Tuesday, August 9th is the next in the series. Um, and that'll be a reading uh, featuring Sass Denny, Paul Druka, uh, Nikki Walschlager, and Ed Roberson. So that should be... A that's a fantastic lineup. That should be great. Um, we do have print newsletters at that table, or you can find us online for more information about that reading and others that are coming up. So I'm going to turn things over uh, now to our first reader, who is uh, Zach Pieper, who is a poet, performer, and recording artist living in Milwaukee. His poems have appeared in editions from Bright Pink Mosquito, Martian Press, Ru uh, Press Rust Buckle Books, Disappearing Book Series, and Dodo Bird. He has performed at Detroit's People's Biennial at MOCAB, collaborated on Hello Caller, an experimental explorative uh, call-in radio show, and recently released the last CDR on Earth, uh, amongst other works centered around live transmission and recorded audio. He has edited for OW and Everyday Genius, and is a co-founder of Activities, an archive of songs, albums, and sound experiments spanning several decades of Milwaukee and Midwest-based musicians and multidisciplinary artists. He's the author of Cameos, Volume 2, recently published by Extra Copies. And I'm sorry I didn't make it sound cool, but um, <laughs> as you requested. But thank you, Zach. Hey, thanks, Michael. That sounded very cool. I appreciate that. I'm going to have you write my bios. Uh, this is a poem. Uh, thanks for inviting me. I very much appreciate it. Uh, this is a poem that I wrote kind of near here on a bunch of napkins while a person was staring at me. Uh, it's called On a Napkin Near the Aster. 485,963 minus 76. No, cross out. 76 minus 485,968. Plus, I'm a pre-existing condition. Scribbling random numerals, skulls, bling, birdies, and loop-de-loops on this fundraiser napkin. To avoid direct eye contact across the bar with a very, I think, drunk, excessively relaxed, professional, individual estimate. 
As God is his legal witness, he watches, and I feel him watch, and catch him wobble, and wipe his mouth, and maybe wonder why don't I see the final score, and the same crowd cheer, and well up with grateful tears, also from my human eyes? Okay, now try to focus on the decor. The faux deco halos hover above our stools. Oops, now our eyes meet briefly. Then this crumpled wad of bills, the lone esoteric eye hidden inside the pyramid on just another scrap of paper that binds us in register. Cha-ching. Now he is chewing, he surveys, he is doing a demo, a sausage demo. At halftime at the bar there is much merriment at a small dog riding a horse into the flames. I try to do a clue for the puzzle. I look up and find his face, sullen, three across. Maybe his cell is dead. Maybe he wonders what my favorite flavor is. He chews and chews. He bears witness. And at peak absorption of attention hidden in my menu and funny feeling of being seen swallowed whole and craving an exit from any given need and the grills all hiss as i exit this guy's gaze hours ago my own cast onto downtown's trail of crumbs before after shots of transformation flat abs popeye boxes bus transfer and fluorescent mobile tea soft pink light crawls up the cream colored bricks cut open by the long arms of the public works utility cranes dangling over where I doodle for years on years across the canal between the smokestacks and behind a curtain of these contracted flags. The Usinger's famous family logo still peaks and I do indeed find myself wondering who makes the sausage. Hey, thanks. I'm sure he was a nice gentleman. He was just staring while I was trying to. Uh, this is, uh, I'm going to read now something I've been doing my whole life, which is um, making portraits in words, very small portraits of various people in my life. Uh, you could think of them as bios or sketches but I was trying to describe without describing and throughout my life whenever I meet someone or someone comes into my life I often will do a portrait of them and here's a selection of those portraits from a book called Cameos which is very long so it's a fun form I recommend it uh, but yeah if we can just think of our mutual awkward silence as the wall upon which I will hang these very small canvases uh, <laughs> Okay, so, this is Carla in this intimate, compelling portrait. Corey, his car starts and it's a miracle. Jesus got told off by the head supervisor while wiping actual human excrement off the retro rainbow walkway entrance. True story. <clears throat> Angel, the birthday chimpanzee, licking whipped cream off a trampoline. Stuart, was he really that small or just very far away? Peg. That's pretty good. Peg goes from operator to nurse's assistant in two full years and still manages the down payment. Meredith pulls over, picks me up, borrows a rake, issues two Xanax, and leaves. Sarah needs to tell Chris to tell Karen to call the insurance company ASAP on TV. Josh. Cousin of Scott married a Weinberger, served in the Gulf, and managed a Bublitz's family restaurant in Lamira. He was 58. Dave. Eerily each single one, like no other Dave. Renee and her insane fucking husband. 
Jess, picture that tan arm, now just a single arm, with an M16. Corey is back up in Michigan hoping y'all will click on this stuff. Arrows. Steve becomes suddenly so much more than mere scenery. Max is a Scottish Terrier age 11 years. Kim stays on four more months at TAB, remarries, relapses, files for divorce, flies to Oakland and opens a food share program. Scott worked several summers at Gleason Reel hanging steel rods up beside us. Scott had what's called a crotch rocket, a Honda. Well, it wasn't exactly a joke to Scott. Tasha took the 19 for one and a half hours, the 21 for one more for 9.50 per hour, then back again tomorrow. Jennifer graduated with a Master of Liberal Arts in Creative Writing and a Certificate of Special Studies in Management from Harvard as well as a Bachelor's of Arts from Wheaton. Jennifer was the 2003 recipient of the Stone Hearth Award for Innovative Fiction. Jennifer, welcome. Brad counts out the overtime in his head ad infinitum. Darnell fastens the rivets that holds the handles on the scaffolds that hoist the picket signs. Chris lost his high stakes position as a management consultant in 08, just found his card. Ronnie, with a crew cut, side fades, class of 93, cracks a Coors, flips us off, and swipes his card, obviously. Dawn had to block her profile. Bernie seems unavoidable. Bethany tightens the taglines. Dwayne, in tux also, flips off all the cameras. Alicia clearly doesn't deserve that dog. Solomon, a stickler for retail. Marge, ironing his big boy Oshkosh bib in front of Fox and Friends, curvy couch teetering on the edge of the fiscal cliff for keeps. Steve again. Steve is simply a great guy. Gary. Plus, what is it he refers to when he repeats, get used to it? Pack. Rolls up his sleeve to show a tattoo of his big brother, Big O. Big grin two years before he died. And my mom has been very cool. My mom is an angel, Pack says to me, outside the pharmacy. She calls me Pack because I love playing Miss Pac-Man with O. Then he blows the smoke out the window, and we go back inside by the grills. Heather lived alone with her mother near the airfield, sotto voce, her laughter described as melody, buried beneath the drone of the Black Hawks. CC took the pay cut, slept in his cutlass. Leon, a student of Giovanni, one notes the excessive okra swishes on all the mustaches. Popeye had pictures of Hitler in his wallet and frightened children with his impression of Popeye popping his peas and pushing the giant cart around the store. Quasi goes meow, elderly organ player from the Episcopal Church devoted to his cat and his doctor's orders. Reed and the other four find danger on their strange trip through a famous professor's bloodstream. Fran relays with elaborate hand gestures, one nightmare in which Ebola super strains infect currency and then expresses mayhaps the symbiology is too obvious. So when the critic she likes starts to look like Lovitz and tries to pick up the check, she wakes up in public and washes her hands a lot. Doug, the retired mail carrier, gives every worker a clip of the New Yorker, cartoon showing a canary disgusted at the newspapers lining the cage. Slava, one foot pops up over the stall, 
pauses the bongo in the restroom of the Polish Falcon's Nest 725. Rabbi sells dying bouquets from the cart on his bike. See, the trouble is he's trying to keep a household here. Blue. Blue is this guy I worked for under the table. Blue did landscaping, lawns, hedges. Blue also had you do things like put flyers on a sea of windshields in a stadium parking lot. Blue had a cover band. They fought a lot. Blue was the kind of guy who really wanted to get to know you. I kind of liked Blue. Then, one day, Blue scared me. He told me about a dream he had while driving on the freeway. End of story. Joan fought the law, and the law had fun. Dean got Ray into UPenn. Ray got Dean into UCAL. Sonia doesn't see much of a representative cross-section. Carol beams to see her niece waving wildly in the personal stories segment. Harmony very nearly worships Morrissey just like some folks do Elvis. Janelle sure hopes someone picked up on the JK tone to her vocals. Tashana sifting through the ashes of what was once her parents' Arkansas home. Rory moves back up from New Orleans day after the Super Bowl, 2011. Janet shuts off Judge Judy's disgust, drops the remote, and drives us to Arby's. Ahmad whips around to ask the cashier what the hell he wanted. Dia produces a valid state ID and registration. Ray, yeah, 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 let me call you back in a sec. I'm at the register here. Tori, her vocals keep cutting in and out. Marcus tries a quick Q&A. Erica is nowhere to be found, but her camera is still on. Quinn took tons of pics of Ken swimming with full consent. Emma circles the dewdrops on your tax returns. Al, alone, believes he bears the burden of proof. Steph, parts kind of reminded me of fast times at Ridgemont but a lot of parts not. TJ, call me, 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 call me. Picture this as concrete poetry. <laughs> Craig, but you must try. You must try to understand he was this complete badass. Jesse, a trail of tiny white spiders of scar tissue running down his biceps in descriptive flourishes. He's working the joystick. Marjorie wasn't amused, but mentioned the benefits of relaxation frequently. Pages of illustrations set next to the organizations listed above. Gregory devotedly, awkwardly, hovering above the slightly tilted glow of his laptop, almost out of body or on mute. Deep Velvet, one cubicle over said, we'd better call me Jerry when Lamont is in the office. Joel, it's been absolutely completely refreshing working with Joel. Pierre, having a conversation with God out loud, alone in Bruno's, 11.47 a.m. Bud, you'd hate to say Falstaff in a Broncos jersey, but... Dan, as Billy Bud is a used car salesman as Gary Busey look-alike in the West Bend Aquatic Center. Harry S. Truman, the S stood for nothing, a Frank Capra sort of leading man, clumsily making a soapbox for himself on top of powder kegs, a champion flea tamer. Ronaldo delivered meatball subs to the Lizard King. Chrissy, secretly gleeful when the server is down. Neil, SimCity simulation expert. Drew got night vision goggles, which was used to an entirely imaginary advantage. 
Sasha installs Photoshop and flushes the goldfish. Delon overemploys the pitch shifter. Elhart newlyweds in a meadow on an Avon calendar above his final bed. Flo talks gene splicing and UFO sightings, prepping the drip as the world turns. Little Pat, armchair anarchist, excelled at puzzles. Medium Pat, slightly rockabilly. Big Pat, inch taller, freckles. Oliver, I'll let you look at my bio if I can look at your bio. Trevor accidentally ate wrapping paper. Road texted the ultrasound to the landlord. Devandra is the name on the tag on the red duffel bag. The Fonz is the unknown soldier. Lois arches a sharp eyebrow at a disarming hesitancy at the dispatcher's announcement. Craig, any fucking, any fucking, any fucking flip the ATV. Wade douses the crowd with indeterminate mixtures. Rochelle smells ketchup on the floor of the free clinic. Peter, a penny pincher and plaid prepaid. Trina, candy crush addict next in line. Luna, that is what makes you believe the logic of the market a magic carpet ride. Rachel chose not to view the body. Jill keeps rewinding the part where the whale bobs in and out of the bay. Jamie fast forwards to the spot where the executive's head explodes. Siri obediently searches recent extinctions. Chrissy hunts for hidden swastikas on 101 Dalmatians. Robin congratulates a power broker in denim on Nightline. Vince earnestly discusses rescindancies in the restroom. Rips in that pair of Oakleys no one can figure out how he paid for. Clint Eastwood, I guess. Melanie crosses out Bigfoot's dick. Jim, all awash in candlelight. Armand commented on his own photo. Christine commented on her own post. Jeb commented on his own status. Ona has got to get a membership so her history will still show up on their screens. River. Sleepy suburban super mutant commando, all teen wolf looks and Celtic tattoos, takes a swig from the hose and plots our probable fates slash income. Stan, honest to God, birther, flat earther, climate denier, whose not so secret superpower is to annoy the caseworker. Nell, a peal of laughter and worshipful joy at the altar of childhood brands. The theme kicks in. Nell perks up. Mattel made bump stocks during Nam, Nell tells us, in the bar of the Empress of China. Willie, the knife sharpener, concludes. Peanut dust and gray beard, grinning. Jalila, wedged between men, wielding dim inklings. Donnie. Flashlight, headband, tiny little ponytail. No prob, Donnie. Philip. Pretty accurate, actually. Hans. The foreign exchange student from Hamburg in front of the assembly on the last day said, I will never forgive you. Tyson says Greg resembles Marky Marcus, Pericles, or whoever in Planet of the Apes. Mia says Gwen seems more like a Jim than a Damien. Denise winces at the price of the reproduction. 
Bev says to Chris, how long does it take? Chris says, Debbie knows. So Bill tells Debbie this, but Debbie hasn't used one in years. So Chris says, oh, let's just ask Don to call the company. But Don doesn't have the number. And when Don tells Debbie this, she says, Chris never knew what he was talking about to begin with. Javante. Javante's mom says Zob is a superhero, says Jesus is a superhero, says Bugsy is always inside the Matrix, says Zob is always inside the Matrix, says every heart of gold belongs to Jesus, okay, a super ninja, yes, but who escapes the Matrix and cuts up the air, because that's how heroes work. D says K told B that D wasn't paying utilities. D didn't deny or offer valid excuse, so B says K says too much that D should say for themselves. B was stuck between something K said and D implied, but B maintains the search for a solution as the whole impetus and the point of this and says so plainly. Bo resides in the gray area. J leans libertarian till the crops get contaminated. Danny is pro-Second Amendment but anti-conceal and carry. Abe is anti-federalist but pro-choice. Mary Kay is pro-life but anti-vaxxer. Nino is originalist but necrophiliac. Luke is anti-fascist but draconian. Blaine is non-GMO but pro-coal, pro-car, pro-jobs. Ruben is dystopian but Faustian at heart. Bev is a pro-free market but Medicare bound. The Fonz is the unknown soldier. Reggie tearfully steps down from the podium. Rex offers an icy no comment. Ian scans for his name in the credits. Nora. Draw a, 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 draw a horse, Nora. Make it run. Put it next to the dead tree. Misty. Blue to gray, ring around her iris. Two eyes open to the only world left. Thank you. Thanks, Zach, so much. Uh, very much appreciated. And now it's uh, my great pleasure to turn things over to Lane Hall. And uh, how you doing? <laughs> Who is a multimedia artist, writer, and professor in the Department of English at uh, the University of Wisconsin Milwaukee where he teaches courses in modernist avant-garde movements, as well as workshops exploring image and text relationships within book and screen formats. His installations have been exhibited at the Brooklyn Museum, the Milwaukee Art Museum, the California Academy of Sciences, the Shanghai World Expo, the Science Gallery in Dublin, and iBeam in New York City. He is the co-founder of the Overpass Light Brigade, a collaborative creative activism project with local roots that has been widely adopted and disseminated and more information can be found online at badscience.org. Lane, welcome and thanks. Can I uh, let's see? Oh yeah, that works. And are we good on the volume? Everybody? Yes? Sounds good. Thanks. I'm happy to be here. Thank you to Woodland Pattern and to my fellow poets. Um, I've known been friends with Portia for many years, and I'm happy to be reading with Zach and with Durio coming up. There was a mutter of rain on pavement, water mixing with dirt, flowing to gutters into dark sewers, down and down rushing to softer ground. Constellations of trash left at sidewalk edges, puddles of fractal slime, a map of stars in the mud, Small things, but nothing less than the whole shitty world on a clod. This is the song I sing for today, these three words, growth and decay. Dogfish Cave. It was a time of flood and water. Fish had grown ears and looked back from cavern pools. They looked hungry and swam to shore. They still couldn't leave the water, so I whistled at them, taunting. A few rose and turned to me. They looked at me. Their faces had the knowing look of scaly human babies learning language. I whistled again and threw a rock at the water. Kersplash, it sunk into the greasy ringlets of rippled foam, expanding, expanding, expanding. 
The fish quivered, disturbed, or excited, and moved closer into the shallows towards me. Some rose up on hind, thin flaps and seemed to hover on the surface of water. Some had noses like dogs, black nostrils, and labored breathing in, out, in, out. I turned and ran through the rocks of the cavern, stumbling, not looking back. I heard flap, flap, flapping and barking like dogs as I ran towards the light of the rough cut sun. No birds. Someone neatly replaced trespassing with chickadees and posted their efforts on the internet. A simple no trespassing sign became no chickadees. It was clever. People seemed to enjoy seeing it and soon no chickadee signs adorned fence posts and private property across the country shared on connective screens. Others emulated, expanding the idea, posting pictures of signs neatly stenciled, scraffitoed, El Marcoed, spray painted, stickered with vinyl and papered with glue. No swimming, no loitering, no shoes, no shirt, no service, no parking, no loading zone, no smoking, no hunting, no engine braking, no speeding, no camping, no firearms, no attendant on duty, no graffiti, no skateboarding, no posting bills, all were transformed. No Caspian terns, no great gray owls, no chipping sparrows, no rufous-sided towhees, no indigo buntings, no northern cardinals, no scarlet tanagers, no ruby-crowned kinglets, no belted kingfishers, no oven birds, no kingbirds, no worm-eating warblers, no American red starts, no white-eyed vireos, no sandpipers, no downy woodpeckers, no goldfinches, no woodcocks, no nuthatches, no gnat catchers. Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, such quirky viral signage interventions ruled the internet for that short, short period of time just before the birds all vanished. Foxfire Teeth I've read of women who had jobs painting radioactive isotopes onto watch faces in order to make the numbers of the hands grow in the glow in the dark. As a boy, I had a watch like this, a winding time axe, and would admire its magic foxfire at night, so bright in the bedroom, so reassuring in darkness, in a hide-and-go-seek closet, the time ticking away forever. Those women at work would joke around and would playfully rub a little of the radioactive paint on their front teeth in order to make their smiles glow in the dark. I want you to picture their break time, the lights turned out, and the lovely smiles of women, girls really, teeth, a luminescent green and eerily floating in the darkness, happy girls laughing full of life and fun, not knowing that they would all die young. Bonk Knob. There was a time when millions of women renamed themselves Mary. Some men also became Marys. My father was a Mary for a while and everyone in the home would titter and say, Mary, what kind of name is that for a man? One day, a specific day, a million Marys decla declared feticide at once, 12 noon, Central Standard Time. I am Mary. We are Marys all. Arrest us. The Marys demanded to be arrested. Marys at clinics, long shuttered, were convo convoyed in busloads conveyed to jails, pens, and prisons. Meanwhile, Karens cross-stitched Bury Your Babies Beautifully at home, church, and Hobby Lobby weekend workshops. They cross-stitched Love Human Life for throw pillows and sachet packs, AR bump stock bucks, and Arctic cat covers, F-150 window cleans, Evan Rude gas caps, Chick-fil-A basket cozies, and Gadsden flags. Cross-stitching Karens felt taxed enough already, while criminal Marys disappeared daily. Fireflies rising. If I could walk, I'd walk 
I'd walk to Lourdes, to London, to Santiago. I'd walk to Seattle, to Akmar, to Chukikamata. I'd walk the Vistula, the Yangtze, the Moss, the Mississippi. If I could fly, I'd fly. I'd fly over Carpathians rich in relief, over Athabasca sheltered in snow, over Ellesmere, over Venezuela stretched along its fractal coast. If I could sit, I'd sit here mute, just us, us two, watching fireflies lifting lazy into velvet night, the future unfolding like the flu. Server farms. The Asian super ant, Lassius neglectus, is attracted to electrical current and establishes massive colonies with multiple queens. The tawny, crazy ant, Nylandaria fulva, will eat through insulation and nest in electrical equipment, causing short circuits in complex systems. Both species were introduced into NSA's Bumble Hive server farm in Utah. Disgruntled Uncle Milton's ant farm line workers supplied anonymous activists with queened colonies and shipping packages sealed with candy plugs designed to dissolve at a specific time within Bumble Hive, freeing the ants to quietly establish their colonies. Minor glitches in the operating system were subsequently reported and months passed before the extent of the threat was recognized. All surveillance activities ceased. Systems remained down. Backup systems are also mysteriously subject to technical problems. Asking questions of the dead. What not to ask? What is your policy on sick leave? What to say instead? What is a typical day like here for someone in this position? What not to ask? What kind of daycare program or family care programs do you offer? What to say instead? I've researched the underworld and noticed that you have excellent incentive programs. It seems a really supportive environment. Has this been your experience here? What not to ask? Will I have to work overtime pushing boulders? What to say instead? What are the day-to-day -day expectations and responsibilities of this position? What not to ask? Why do you think I'd be a good fit for the underworld? What to say instead? What attracted you to this organization in the first place, and what do you like most about being here? What not to ask? So, Theresius, what did you have to do to get your high-ranking position? What to say instead? Is there currently room for advancement within this organization? What not to ask? This place sounds pretty cool. Why did the last person leave? What to say instead? Is this a new position or am I replacing a previous person? What not to ask? I really hated my last boss because he was always micromanaging. Is that something that you do? What to say instead? How would you describe your management style? What not to ask? Can I use your phone? I think I need to call my ride. What to say instead? Thank you for your time. I hope to see you in the future. Spirit of growth. Trillium out, daffodils gone, may apple out, adder's tongue gone, hepatica gone. Bird noises, owls at night, morning green, new buds so soft and light. Yellow green, sage green, viridian, violets yellow and blue. Cedars turn the sunrise pink. Our Phoebes are back. They flit and flick their tails, perched on the top of the shovel, left standing near the garden. They swoop on insects from the ground, rising. Rose-breasted grosbeaks, sparrows, chickadees, orioles like orange splashes in the sugar maple trees. Visiting dignitaries, too, the wood ducks, mallards, a sharp-shinned hawk screes for food. Vultures perch like old men hunched over card tables and discussing finance and roadkill. Garter snakes bask in the warming sun, silent and still. There is a dead mallard in the back of my old and rusted pickup truck. 
neck limp, green head iridescent like regal raiment, eyes not yet clouded, body not cold. I don't know why I picked it up, but it was too holy to leave on the road. Perhaps I will sketch its shape, its form, its wingspan. Perhaps I might teach it to fly again. Micro Mollux. This maybe I should say is an ode of my hatred to ticks. Working like demons, never pausing, little carriers in stars encoded. Protected order of the swarm, saints of crystalline form. I dream of acrobats spinning from egg to egg, indifferent to us at scale, both guarded and guardian. Hard and hardening, skeletal scorning, our feeble genes. Our wondrous cities, bio-machines, our earth we think we own. But when the four horses come, they won't be big but small, arriving on wing, on foot, on rasping claw, ecstatic in release from branch or grass, trusting to temperature as they drop and fall, biting into a body's tender flesh, a binary indifference to all. And finally, a to-do list while falling from the clouds. One, increase wind resistance. Two, quickly grow wings. Three, decrease gravity if at all possible. And four, locate a large soft thing for landing. Thanks. Lane, thank you so much. Um, really glad to have you here. Um, and now it's a great pleasure to welcome Portia Cobb, who is a multi-hyphenated artist and poet, deeply interested in telling stories that reflect the double consciousness of Black American identity, history, memory, and forced forgetting. Her body of work and research has joined these themes within her poems, short form documentary video, photographic essays, field recordings, collaborative installation, and community-engaged performance art. She teaches at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee in the Department of Film, Video, Animation, and New Genres, and it's a great pleasure to welcome Portia Cobb. I think I'm shrinking. <laughs> How is everybody? Thank you. It's, it's really a pleasure to be on the roster with great poets and meeting for the first time a couple, but Lane and I have known each other a while, as he mentioned. Um, I was trying to think today what I might start with, and I wrote a new poem. Um, wrote, I've written a couple new poems in the last couple days, and they're kind of connected. Um, one is more in reflection of my birthday this year, so I'll read the very last one later, um, but I'll read this one. And I'm thinking about these poems in this way right now, but I'm sure they'll change. This one is called 68 uh, Suns and Moons at Edisto. So I mention Edisto a lot because I go there. It's in South Carolina, one of the islands. June returns, and I spend my birthday near the water at Eddie Stowe. On this morning, I write 68 suns and moons in a social media post as both a salute to undulating waves and resignation to time. I release control of desires to contain the past within the present, a post experience, a post incentive, a post body here, leaving them on the water's edge, watching them float farther and farther over the horizon. This June birthday is one of mourning and celebration. I am confronted by the inevitable, the erosion of life, the simultaneity of loss and regeneration. I walk barefoot on sand and place my feet in the foamy Atlantic Tiny grains shift beneath my toes at the ocean's edge, my balance more unstable than I recall. Um, a lot of the images that I write about are 
um, in other places, um, but I wanted to share one that I wrote a while ago about gardens because I love gardens and I love gardening. In the garden, these hands touch soil, its brown spectrum collecting under my nails, returns me to my southern field, working the land, the hours, contained life lessons. Where I observed my own revival and recovered what I lost in earthly matters, touching was visceral, tactile, sensual, healing, and completed me. I heard my own breath when bending, my own voice in a whispered mantra issued to coax weeds from beneath, their roots as deep as my own. I'm going to read um, a poem that was written for an image. And um, artist John Horvath um, had a show that was called Wide Eyed, and he asked several poets, thinkers, people to respond to the image. So I'd like to read what I wrote for that. Oops, this is moving. It's called Archway. Some say capturing images of ruin and decay evoke a kind of abandonment porn. But for whom? Is it taboo, like dancing on a grave or kissing a corpse? Perhaps I am transfixed by the possibility of ghosts moving between its arches. Down south, we discard shoes worn to the cemetery for the burial to prevent the spirit of the deceased from following us home. We break a favorite cup, bowl, plate of the dead and leave it on their grave. What should we leave here at the site of this portal, these arches? What are you remembering? What have I forgotten? Is it something unpleasant for me, romantic for you, obscene for another? What are you remembering? What have I forgotten? Does the image bring to mind a dream or evoke time encapsulated in a flash? Shouldn't one quietly take note of the beauty of its decay? Examine it as a relic to validate its end, middle, beginning? Choose to tag it with their own mark or Pan by it from a fast moving car or train, recording it only as a blurred landmark. Thank you, Archway. I'm gonna write, um, I'm gonna write, I'm gonna read a poem that um, was included in a volume of poems and essays um, edited um, by two writers from South Carolina, one of which uh, died before the publication was finished. And this project took place um, at the start of COVID. It's called Under Their Gaze. Under Their Gaze, post-traumatic slavery stress is an angry sound bite compressed to mitigate the gravity of their amnesia and fright under their gaze, we brighten our skin to lighten their burden, relax our curls, code switch our diction, and apologize to those who won't tie their tongues to speak a new fiction. Under their gaze, we become lawn jockey stand-ins at luncheons, picnics, and plantation social functions, where American history is lubricated to become centric to savvy saviors, not our captors nor enslavers. Where black bodies deemed safe enough for orgies of white guilt are found sprawled lifeless beneath balconies in early morning light or swinging in the breeze from trees. Under their gaze, black death is justifiable homicide. Our grief 
palpable spectacle, peacock beautiful, a peculiar, curious collectible under their gaze. Okay, I have a couple more. Oh, this is, uh, this is moving. <laughs> it's getting lower and lower. Tight. Not yeah, tight. Can you bring it up a little bit more? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Mm. Oops. Every time I touch it, it does something. What am I doing? Okay. I won't touch it. Um, as I mentioned, sometimes I'm thinking about images in the places that I visit. Um, this one is called Road to Eddie Stowe. Long after sunset, local men wearing steel-toe work boots straddle the narrow shoulder of a meandering two-lane highway in pitch blackness, placing one foot in front of the other, inches from the ditch. My bright lights catch the flash of iridescent white teeth. In my periphery, a herd of deer strides swiftly, weaving between the long needle pine trees, their velocity completes, I'm sorry, their velocity competes with my vehicle on this road to Edisto traveling is merciful, a meditation, a chant, a psalm, a prayer. Can I do two short ones? Okay. I found this um, poem. I wrote it a while ago, and I probably would change <laughs> change things in it. But I thought because of summer, I might read it. Um, I don't share all my love poems. I'm not in love anymore with the person I wrote it for. <laughs> so let's not get it twisted. <laughs> Um, but I thought it was a clever poem at the time. Oops, this is going down. Okay, let me hold this so I can manage it. It's called Summer Melons. I sit contemplating how to get your swagger back. Days that once seemed short drag by. A fixation I have of our time in the sun perplexes you. I paint my toenails red and pull on heels to accentuate the muscle in my calves, the sway in these hips that once evoked a mention, a caress, a longing slow glance. Now your eyes scan over my frame, missing these details. I sit contemplating the fruit fly, zooming in on the scooped out watermelon rind you left and think of that first weekend we spent in our marital bed, your large hands cracking open that juicy fruit, scooping out its crimson sweetness to quench our palates. Now, like the fruit fly hovering nearby, you've become elusive, hard to capture. I once heard that sugar water in a jar or a narrow necked bottle will attract and trap them. So I go about sweetening my narrow necked sugar pot with scented lotions and essential oils and come to bed on newly laundered sheets that you simply pull in the opposite direction. Each night I kiss your back in the dark and you beg me to allow you to sleep. In this void, I lay contemplating the succulence of ripe summer melons and the mating habits of the fruit fly. And then this is one that I just wrote, and I'll end with this one. Um, so when I was visiting South Carolina, I visit family, and something unfortunate happened when I was there um, that was just resolved. And I shared this on social media. Um, so this is called Traveling Mercies for Lamar. Um, this is someone I consider a cousin who disappeared. Um, so I'm going to tell you the story. 
On that sunny Sunday last February down home, you turned a corner off Tugadoo Road toward Oakville and tooted your horn. Standing in the road, I pivoted to see you in your Sunday best. You paused to greet me like your mother used to do, just like Katie, I was thinking, when she'd park and step over the ditch to stand with me in the yard. Your exuberant full smile, your distinctive high octave lilting voice captured my attention, rooted me on that Sunday at the meeting place under the cover of oak trees. Your windows were wide open, catching the breeze, your arm extended and your palm waving, waving as you continued down the road, your round familiar face enough more than enough to ground me. I replay it now after the news of your untimely loss. This moment is eternally fixed in the grid of time, a gift of remembrance. You, like your mother Katie, pausing to greet me, extending wishes for traveling mercies under the cover of ancient oaks along Tugadu and Oakville roads, common ground, a final point of departure that I couldn't have imagined. For Lamar, thank you. And now, an absolute pleasure to welcome um, Duriel Harris, who's a poet, performer, and sound artist. She's the author of three print volumes of poetry, including her most recent, No Dictionary for, of a Living Tongue, Drag and Amnesia, Multi-genre works include her one-woman theatrical performance, Thingification, and Speleology, a video collaboration with artist Scott Rankin. Co-founder of the avant-garde trio Black Took Collective, Harris has been a McDowell and Malay Colony Fellow and has received grants from the Illinois Arts Council Agency, the Cave Canem Foundation, and the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. Her work has appeared in numerous venues, including uh, BAX, Best American Experimental Writing. The And Now Awards of Poetry and Protest, Plowshares and Troubling the Line, Trans and Gender Queer Poetry and Poetics, and The Best of Fence. The 2018 Often Poet, Harris is an Associate Professor of English in the Graduate Creative Writing Program at Illinois State University and the editor of Obsidian, Literature and Arts in the African Diaspora. Uh, thank you so much for being here, Gabriel. I'm, I'm going to, I'm sure, something that I say at times, which is just true. Uh, can you adjust? Thank you. I'm going to make a, a few corrections uh, to the bio. The bio is a little, a little um, out of date. Um, in the least, I will say that I am a professor at this point. Um, so that's a, a good thing. Um, and, uh, you know, there are a few other things, but that's one of the most, uh, significant ones. And I'm, I'm hoping that, um, that will position me to be able to do a certain kind of truth telling. Um, I, I, I really don't know where to begin. There are so many things I don't I don't know. Many of us are in that position where we're feeling um, as we are our bodies, not in our bodies, but are our bodies um, under siege and having been under siege for some time um, and thinking about how to present poems at this time that could take us somewhere and help you, and if you don't need it, help me, um, transform some of what it is that I'm experiencing into something uh, productive. I am having some difficulty 
because it's hard. It's difficult being these moments. So I'm going to begin with a piece that feels right now to me. Um, I don't know if I would say aspirational, but it's called Listen, Love, Life. Listen and oh, feel it. I wish I could show it to you. It's, um, it's a visual piece that's handmade um, in pen and ink and some pencil. Um, and it has a bit of color, some yellow, some blue, a bit of red. Um, and some of this is printed inside of, um, inside of the profile of a gun. And the work is uh, called, uh, actually the, the title of it, I, I gave you the subtitle, the title of it is How We Get Free, Dream in Wartime, Listen, Love Life, and Oh, Feel It. So I have to make it larger to read it. I awake hearing Fannie Lou Hamer saying, we're gonna fight for freedom and Tracy Chapman saying freedom now, firmly in my ear. I am an older woman, a few years older than I am now. And slavery is still the law of the land, much of it, but we live in the North, North of the MD, the Mason Dixon line. And I am surrounded by children playing. I'm standing in open air, feeling the breeze and sun on my face leaning up against a post off of the front steps of the store I own, where we work in town. One child, a brown boy about eight years old, wants to go for a ride with another child, a much lighter girl. His mother says, okay, but tells them to be careful, to be watchful, because it can be dangerous for little brown girls and boys. The street is very, very wide and very dusty, lined with wooden plank sidewalks and shops. Our storefront is wooden with a bell at the door. Not long after I look down the road in the direction of the fields where the children, the two have gone in a cart. I, I see something alarming, everyone is coming back, sudden hush and hustle and bustle, and it is time to hide. I am at first alarmed because of the children, but see that they too have returned, are returning. I slip into the store and very directly into the back, the very back, a storage room, very dingy, not dirty really, but, but shabby, dark with disuse, and there's a cabinet, I hide in it. It's made for hiding with a false bottom and enough room for folk to sit upright. Maybe 10 people could fit without being cramped and arranged just so for the benefit of whoever come looking. Later, a little one comes to get a game and I know it's all clear. Fugitive, I was one of the few to hide then there are other women there my age. I touch their faces, arms and hands in recognition and love slowly one by one. They tell the children, I am a good woman, their grandmother. And I pick up one of the toddlers who is about to wail, then calms in my arms, Sarah. That was a dream that I had, a dream in wartime. This piece is a piece of imagined theater. Uh, who goes with Caesar? A drama in one act. The whole. A thick and layered darkness, a heavy odor of smoke, a periodic foul wind. Where one might imagine a stage, there is a deep pit. 
in it a shallow pool of dark liquid and an ordinary object stained with blood, urine, and feces among them. A once white pocket square, a ladder, a nylon rope, a parrot perch, a broom, 800,000 machetes, a garden hose, a metal shop stool, a plastic bucket, a wire hanger. Flickers of white and colored light suggestive of a series of static visual images are projected from behind a cerecloth scrim. The sound of children playing, i.e. a schoolyard at recess. Time, summer evening, the present. One, the exegesis for those who've been taught that you only kill what you eat. Leader addresses the congregation. Leader speaks unseen. The voice surrounds all gathered. Like any predator in the wild, by instinct, empire kills to eat. Its agents and offspring, pale and swarthy, root enslavers, nobles and legislators alike, come conquering to subdue, maim, and kill multitudes. We assure you, there is no excess, for we are ravenous. We savor by degrees each sudden, slow-cooked death until we ourselves succumb or are slain or portioned out. And even then, we hunger. Ours is a different kind of eating. Beat. Come, let us descend and touch. At present, smoldering Caesar, replenished to fall, growing another's heart, a vessel looming, a sword. Two. The olive branch. Chorus addresses the congregation. Chorus descends to hover inches above the pit. The bodies of chorus are barely perceptible. The voices emanate from the pit. Chorus. Truth is a kind gesture and forgiveness a fierce and violent skill acquired through trial and hardship. I have befriended my rage, my beauty, and the strange character foisted upon me. Presumed incompetent, I remain unimagined and thus cautious with hopes and wishes. Three, the catechism. Leader and congregation enact a ritual call and response. Leader speaks unseen, the congregation comprised of chorus and people, hovers, bodies barely perceptible above the pit. Leader, what is your name? People from memory, I am the warm sea. Chorus, I am the sail and compass. People from memory, I am the blue shadow of you. I own the fat lips, the flat nose, the bristling. I own the tight spiral, the padlocked dumbwaiter, the wool gray strongbox. Chorus and people in unison, your longing and jubilant blackness. Leader, who entrusted you with these riches? Who bestowed upon you the mark? Who called you to the hold? Chorus and people walk a labyrinth levitating above the pit. Four, the harvest. Chorus addresses the congregation. The bodies of people meld into the darkness. The bodies of chorus are barely perceptible at start, then gradually meld into the darkness. The voices emanate from the pit and the canopy of the heavens. The canopy rustles. Chorus. Before you are manifest the four portions of your inheritance, its myriad divisions beginning with these. Four paths, four pillars, four elements, four principles. 
four messengers, four trials, four sons, four virtues, four causes, four judgments, four powers, four truths, four humors, four boundaries, four questions, four rituals, four faces of conquest, four faces of war, four faces of famine, and four of plague, four mysteries, four commandments, four axes of dimension, four fixations of belief, the four chambers of your mammalian heart, its four stomachs, its four tongues, its four rows of teeth, its four columns of eyes. I know, strange. May that not come to pass. What vocable thunders threatens? This is kind of how I feel. Someone is always crying, where is God? Deliverance, loud and hot enough to shake and burn to burst ushering all it touches to combust, to shatter and keep to shattering mercies, perimeter and core. Dust is the first skin, forgetfulness the second. Slaughters fragrance, bitter water blessing the altar, shards mixed into the mortar, poured into the foundation of the houses where gods sleep and get their checks. Red dominion, Chattering hymns, bombs, and rockets, congregants sweeping overheard by tatters, dancing the bullet jerk, where debris scattered limbs and pulp once answered to names, tight packages, where a thousand word libraries. What one in many names, what embers. And my tongue swells in my throat, a spoiled root sewn into the ground. My tongue sharpens upon the rocks, a blade for reaping. Oh, where is God? I feel like saying you don't have to clap after each read. It's strange, the clapping. Um, I just want to read a few more. I don't know. Is that OK? Yeah. All right. Um, this is a reflection upon a presidential election and my participation in the project of US democracy. It's called Resident Alien. The president is yellow sticky, a small house, engorging fecal fog, dirt floor field, take, contain, have, unfinished dumb wind, swallowing more swallowing, dry sacks, rocks, blood vats, joists, crawl, foul water, dark pulse, pus, cake debris, bulk oil, grease, squeeze, shanty mind, hate genie, always hungry, another. The air hot and thick with smoke I could not see but felt settling. I wanted to draw the birds flying low over rooftops, the sliver of sky I could see from there, my back porch in the gangway, I had returned to a place not mine, words not mine, rags stuffed into the walls, plaster buckles and cracks. How did I know I would live? How do I know I will live? My head, my throat are on fire, my mind splintering across the gangway. Daniel is dead down below in his apartment, the radio blaring through the hall into the bathroom and out into the gangway. It's for my neighbor, Daniel from COVID. And this one, many of us work. Yes. And sometimes we wonder why. There was, a, there was a card once that I saw and it said, why I work, an essay. I like food, the end. Um, and people have been speaking of the great resignation, um, the energy, right, that we have or say, you know, what, what, why, why should I do this? I've learned some things 
the best thing about being alive is love. Being present with other folks, poets and poets and people and trees and other kinds of people, cats and dogs, right? These beings that live, that's, that's what it is to be alive. That's why, that's why being. The work is to be able to make it so that I can enjoy the why of being, not to just be working. So this is a poem that's uh, a little different. It's kind of something I had to write in order to express and push back against certain demands. It's called Pray Song. Prayer before drowning the empty hours. To throw it all downwind into the work sewers. To be that thing. To push through dark gravel and fetid waste. To sweep and burrow, hastening the bent shape of water into the hardening turn to hum head down, to hum flank and haunch, hum blister, hum bleed, hum mud dead meat, become dull delirium drone. Bold blood turnip, blood wet stone, drum through fever, hunger, cramp and chill, drum through rough rack and flood, scrub the sturdy stain of sleep, clutch, clutch the transient Plank, drudge, then grunt. Lucky bridge, sweat kerosene. Drill and dredge the silt bed. Suppress and suck. Gulp the bruised jelly head, the bone bread, scruff the spade. Swallowing claw and growl, burnt oil, scant knot clusters. Blank gunk cabinet, blank gunk gauge. Compass whistle and want rut. Dig and grunt, 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 grease piston tracking gear grunt clay dirt shunt mud shunt belt buck shot cud grinding shove and grunt heavy mud pocket mud pad heart thudding grunt locked they head stopped with rope sputter mouth teeth glint grunt mud gums grunt coarse gristle grunt sludge tongue coarse ground slosh gretchet naught Slung, song, song, grunt, and hum along. Let's not, right? <laughs> Let's not do that. Let's not do that. Okay. Um, and that hurt. I want to end. Ooh. Okay, I'm going to read something. I don't want to end here, though. So I'm going to have to find something else to end with. I've I've been in this space, and the and the poems they're they're not they're not I they're not happy. Do you know what I mean? Um, so I'm leaving you stuff to think about. Maybe not. You know, it's not like rejoicing. Uh, I live in Chicago. I live uh, in Rogers, East Rogers Park. I live close to Evanston. Um, I spend a lot of time on the North Shore. Uh, the Saturday before July 4th, I was in Highland Park. This poem had already been started and it's fitting. On the roof, a boy, mouth, nostrils, hands, packed, with dirt, as if having risen from burial, from the grave, from the ground. Goggles, blue knit cap yanked down round his ears, standing still, leaning slightly forward toward the hard, rocky, paved gravel, stony ground below. White dust breath, like smoke from his chest, toward the shallows, toward the crowd.
Mm. I'm trying to find something. Okay, okay. I'm going to ask you all. I'm going to ask you all to bear with me. I'm going to read something. It's a little bit longer, but I'm going to read something. Try to give us somewhere a little bit, somewhere else to be. <laughs> somewhere else to be. Okay, this is called, uh, it's called Kayla. Kayla Kiki. It's a little story in the in the world of poetry. It's a part of an issue called Playground um, that's edited by Ronaldo V. Wilson, an issue of Obsidian that's forthcoming. Her name used to be Kayla. That's what her family still calls her, except for her father, who doesn't even bother to acknowledge the girl or the woman she's become says she betrayed where she came from. But her mother can't deny she still got the same bright brown eyes, the same soft-spoken quality. Humility, a lady, no matter who she lies between her thighs, it's probably all lies besides. Keller never said nothing outright, not even out of spite, when Stan, her dad, went at her hard, like he would a man. The whole block came outside. He was clowning her, riding her. Good old Deacon Stan. It was wild. He was hot, blackout mad, hearing that his only daughter had been photographed more than once or twice at the speakeasy down the street and had been seen night after night across town, dressed to the nines, hanging with drag queens and bull daggers. Kayla barely made a sound. Nary said a word when he beat her down. You want to be a man? What's a bull dyke going to do for you? Acting like a common whore, sending in full view of the world, full view of the Lord. I raised a proper Christian girl, not a nasty pervert. You don't care who you hurt. Think of your mother. And if taking a lover wasn't bad enough, you have to show your ass like common trash. Well, I've had enough of this harlotry, undercover chicken and jiving with sissies, mannish women and braggers. Go sleep in the streets. Don't come around here. This is my house where the Lord resides. Don't dare mock him with your selfish pride. Only the grace of God saves. You nasty, silly bitch, you better pray. Went upside her head with a Bible and he walked away. Now they call her Kiki and they say that she's a dyke. Say she's been after other girls since she could ride a bike. Say she's living with a model, that's the kind of girl she likes. They stay up late to do the nasty every single night. Now they call her Kiki. She only came by in a day after that and brought her mother nice things back from wherever she was at, like things her father didn't know about, like freshwater trout from seaside, spice from the port when her mom's was getting short, gemstone jewelry, vintage music boxes, and antique homemade lace. But you should have seen her face when her father took the day off, supposedly to play golf. He hid his clubs in the bushes and waited there in that tacky green leisure wear he's famous for. And just as he thought and the neighborhood said, she got dropped off by a pretty woman in a red sports car with a drop top. His heart almost stopped when they kissed smack dab on the lips. He jumped out of the hedges screaming, what you come here for? She made it just inside the door. He nearly knocked her to the floor, but shit really hit the fan when Sister Alice took a stand, blocked him with her body and a cast iron skillet in her hand and a kitchen mallet behind her back. Stood in front of Kayla, face to face with that man. He said, woman, she said, stand. Don't take another step toward my child. So help me, God is my witness, I will end you take you out of business sure as lightning makes thunder and you wonder why the girl couldn't stay in this house with your hypocritical sermons on the mouth you ought to be ashamed and she sent him off to do whatever so she could visit with her baby girl Kayla the child that always made her smile now they call her Kiki and they say that she's a dyke say she's been after other girls so she could ride a bike she's living with a model that's the kind of girl she likes they stay up late to do the nasty every single night. Now they call her Kiki. I saw her just the other day, around the way with a girlfriend at the farmer's market on 10th, laughing with the vendors, talking shit and giggling. When I walked up, she looked surprised, dropped her lover's hand and stared at me sideways. I said, what up? Nice to see you in the hood. Where was you uh, when coming back? 
You was too good for regular folk who wasn't famous or rich, dripping with glitz, flipping the whole shebang, fab and fake wolves and snakes dabbling in coke and eating that cake. She looked less than amused and was about to split. When I stopped playing, I said, wait, you know I don't believe that shit. I know you're, you visit your moms when you can, watch your old man slip off to work wearing them expensive ass shirts he thinks he won from the company. The whole neighborhood knows it's your money. Betcha he knows it too. But what's a man to do when he's laid down the law? There was an awkward silence, a dramatic pause, like in a movie when the cutie goes off with the nerdy boy. Then she smiled like when we were kids. I had to grin. She introduced me to her girlfriend. She had thick black hair, beautiful smooth skin and dimples. Suki, this is Kenya, the woman I live with, love with, play with. Suki and I used to be ace. Yeah, real tight, I said, as I stared at the ground, the way our shadows played a game with the light. Peace, I said, I, I should go. It was really nice meeting you though. Kenya touched my hand like she knew something about me. Kayla kissed my, kissed my cheek. We'll speak, she shouted from across the street. Suki hangs with Kiki even though she is a dyke. They used to chase the other girls riding on their bikes. They bar hop across the city with the shiki crowd they like. Suki comes home really late every single night. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Duriel. Thank you again to Portia, to Lane, to Zach. Um, and to all of you for joining us, uh, been a beautiful night. I appreciate you all, and I hope that you'll join us again next month, August 9th. And until then, enjoy the night. <laughs>